Debashish is logging in from Calcutta. Maybe give him a couple more minutes. It's six in the morning there, five thirty in the morning. <clears throat> Hello, Debashish. What time is it in Calcutta, Debashish? set yeah so I, as uh, some saw in the thread i was planning on starting with a a chant from the beginning of the life divine the second epigram it's uh by vama deva and i'd like to walk you through it so that perhaps the mind can have a chance to let go it's Threefold are those supreme births, and by threefold are those supreme births, the Rishi is referring to a birth into matter and birth into life and birth into mind. And then the Rishi declares that the supreme births are true and desirable. Then the Rishi references uh, cosmic consciousness, cos cosmic consciousness moving wide, overt, within the infinite, and shining, pure, and luminous. Then the next statement distills down into individual consciousness with the statement, that which is immortal in mortals, our soul, that which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the truth, is a god, our soul is a god, and established inwardly as an energy working out in our divine powers. Then the Rishi Vamadeva finishes the invocation, invoking strength, become high uplifted, O oh strength, invoking strength to pierce all veils and establish in us the things of the Godhead. So, We'll do a one minute med meditation, then I'll chant it three times and then follow with another minute meditation. And then as suggested, we could, um, uh, it could be pretty open after that. Um, there's a lot of questions that people have. We're in the portion of the text moving from part one, which is metaphysics to part two, which is epistemology and, uh, and, uh, this could be exciting and, and fun. Hmm. Flo is joining us from Germany, too. I think we're spanning the globe. 
Threefold are those supreme births of this divine force that is in the world. They are true, they are desirable. He moves there wide overt within the infinite and shines pure luminous and fulfilling that which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the truth is a god and established inwardly as an energy working out in our divine power Become high uplifted, O strength, pierce all veils, manifest in us the things of the Godhead. Threefold are those supreme births of this divine force that is in the world. They are true, they are desirable. He moves there wide overt within the infinite and shines pure, luminous, and fulfilling. That which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the true is a God and established inwardly as an energy working out in our divine powers. Become high, uplifted, O strength, pierce all veils, manifest in us the things of the Godhead. Threefold are those supreme births of this divine force that is in the world. They are true, they are desirable. He moves there wide overt within the infinite and shines pure, luminous, and fulfilling. That which is immortal in mortals and possessed of the truth is a God and established inwardly as an energy working out in our divine powers. Become high uplifted, O strength, pierce all veils, Manifest in us the things of the Godhead. Become high uplifted, O strength, pierce all veils. Manifest in us the things of the Godhead. O
So other than opening it up for questions, I don't have any plans. Would anyone like to start? Oh, everyone, Debashish is joining from Calcutta, and it's very early in the morning, and I, I'm super appreciative that you could join us, Debashish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. And that was such a beautiful invocation with which you started. I'm uh, reading and discussing with a friend at this time, uh, the Kena Upanishad. And uh, this invocation was so, so like a succinct crystallization of the Kena Upanishad, particularly Sri Aurobindo's discussion of it. So I had a question based on our recent reading, the last batch of readings. Um, uh, so uh, Sri Endo Bindo in the last chapter of the first book, first section, call, talks about the overmind as distinct from the supermind, as this sort of lower intermediate structure between mind and supermind. I wondered if somebody could help make that a little bit clearer. Uh, <clears throat> so should we uh, t take uh, all the questions first and then uh, uh, I can address them because there may be overlaps. So uh, I'll just wait for some time and uh, if anybody else has any questions, then we can uh, discuss all the questions together. Or if not, uh, we could start with that question and see how it opens up. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea of the overmind, which Sri Aurobindo feels in that last uh, chapter, uh, is something that he actually came to a little late. Uh, he discusses the overmind only after he went into seclusion in 1926 and uh, before that so that particular those chapters are late written later and uh, before that uh, he didn't make a distinction between overmind and supermind uh, overmind gradually becomes a really important intermediate layer for him uh, in 1926 the realization he had, he initially took that to be the supermind, but he realized that it was not the supermind. But he also had already received guidance about these cosmic planes of consciousness above the mind. And one may say that the overmind is the last uh, layer of the cosmic mind. Sometimes he has used the word mind with a capital M for overmind. Um, the distinction, as you must have come across, between overmind and supermind is in that the overmind is like a kind of a double of the supermind, so that there is a very thin film between overmind and supermind. In supermind, there are four forms of knowing. And in the life divine, he doesn't talk about that much, but he does talk about it a little in the synthesis. And he talks about it in the essays on the Kena Upanishad, actually. And he 
gives them their Sanskrit names, they are Vigyana, Pragyana, Samgyana, and Agyana. And I think I see Don Salmon here. We had some discussions about these. You have a good memory. It was 10 years ago. Uh, really? These are, right, right, right. I remember, you know, you were writing your book at the time. So uh, one of them, Pragyana, actually all of them are forms of Vigyana. Vigyana is the super mind consciousness. Super mind in, 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 in the Upanishads, uh, Sri Aurobindo identifies Vigyana with super mind consciousness. But it's also treated as the overarching form of knowledge of the super mind. Uh, and, and, you know, if necessary, we can discuss this later, but just to uh, hone in on Pragyana, which is the first uh, movement out from Vigyana, Pragyana is uh, apprehending knowledge. So it is as if the one consciousness is looking at its constituents in whatever way it may look at them. So being an infinite consciousness, it can configure itself in infinite ways to itself. And every possibility of self-configuration within its infinite consciousness can be held at a certain distance from itself so that it has an independence and an objectivity to it. But at the same time, it knows that it is the one that looks at, at its self-constituents. That is not lost. It's put behind a little bit. But it is still the overriding consciousness with which it uh, apprehends its own possibilities. Now, if this objectify, objectifying capacity hardens, if, in other words, by an act of consciousness, a veil is put between the one and its many possibilities, then you have overmind consciousness. And you may say that this idea of the veil becomes harder as one goes down the uh, you know, operations of the pragyana. It's really mind is a specialized operation of the pragyana. Uh, I like to give a, a, a kind of an analogy because projecting and objectifying is what projectors do. And so we may think about, for example, a movie which is being projected on a wall through a projector. And if we take the dimension of the uh, of the projection as a reality. In other words, let's say that what's being projected is a reality in which the individuals have a consciousness of their own. Uh, they live in a certain kind of world, a world of a certain dimension, a dimension that is the dimension of the projection, the objectified dimension. And they may awaken to the fact that they are actually being projected. But in coming to the source of the projection, they will arrive at the projector. The projector is where the dimensional reduction has occurred. They're unable to go behind the projector and see what it is that the projector is projecting. This is the wall. So in a way, the overmind constitutes that kind of wall of a certain kind of consciousness, the mind consciousness, which is a sort of split off or specialized from the supermind consciousness in that it is an objectification, an objectifying function of supermind which has hardened or brought a certain kind of a lid upon itself to reduce its dimensionality. So what is, the, 
you know, this, the whole idea of mind and super mind comes up and some people say, why did he have to coin this term? And many people say that he could have used the term divine mind, for example. And some people say that other traditions talk about mind with a capital M in the same way as Sri Aurobindo talks about super mind. But he's very particular about differentiating between mind and super mind. Over mind is the kind of last, uh, you know, characteristically mind consciousness, a cosmic mind consciousness. And the difference can be understood again by looking at the same analogy in that mind is a dimensional reduction ontologically speaking. So as a result, it has certain types of limitations. The major limitation being that of the law of contradictions. So in other words, you cannot be A and not A at the same time. Uh, this goes all the way down. It goes down into our experience of separative consciousness. So I cannot be myself and not myself at the same time. So in, in various ways, this kind of law of exclusion is characteristic of the mind. But in super mind, one can be A and not A at the same time because it's a higher dimension. It's a dimension in which multiple possibilities of dimension exist. So one can have the dimension of time, which is the dimension of becoming, and the dimension of space, which is the dimension of being, coexist. They are two, two uh, I mean, existences uh, that coexist in experience in supermind. But in mind, there can be, that there, there is a distinction between them. So that in the experience of becoming, one actually is in the flow of time, hoping that one could be out of time, which is one of our problems of, of being human, or one can be out of time and lose the movement of the becoming. See? So these, these are the problematics of mind that emerge as soon as this kind of veil is put between the one and its many projects, so to say. And that is what the overmind does, uh, taking on the function of something in supermind, the objectifying function in supermind. Uh, any, uh, if, if, uh, if that uh, answers your question, Jeffrey, or if there are any other, uh, I, Questions, ideas, comments that you or anybody else have? Well, well, in the text, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you very loud and clear. Yeah. On page 282, um, he says um, the overmind is a magician craftsman empowered to weave the multicolored warp and woof of manifestation of a single entity in a complex universe. A magician craftsman. So he's making something. Could you elaborate on that? What exactly is he making? Well, it's, it's yeah, definitely it's beautiful. It's a magician craftsman, and what it's what what it's making is the unfolding of its possibilities in a logical form. So this is the cosmic mind to which. The entire, it's, you know, there is an idea, what Sri Aurobindo calls real idea in supermind. It becomes the idea of the becoming in overmind. And what it does is that it, it creates these separate realities. So it creates these divisions between matter, life, the what we started with the Mateo's invocation, the three births, the births of matter, life, and mind, and their emergences over time uh, is an idea that is the idea of evolution uh, is actually being given its, its 
you know, kind of uh, lines of unfoldment by by the by the overmind, and uh, also these laws by which we by which uh, the entire cosmos is held, so that the divine is born into that, and the divine's birth into that is you know that the three births of the high flame that Matteo was talking about that's happening at each of these levels is still under the uh, the aegis of the over and the supreme the supramental purusha also enters that as a one may say a monad uh, the monad that is evolving there is an evolution of prakriti and an evolution of purusha so the evolution of purusha is the monad the monadic form of the supramental purusha that fragments itself into its possibilities and evolves over time but subjects itself to the overmind and that's the reason why the psychic being in itself cannot overpass the possibilities of overmind until it has its second birth in it becoming the overmind consciousness it has to pass through that and then realize its power beyond that you know that that it is more powerful than the cosmic mind so the cosmic mind stands you know this craftsman magician is really in another way that we can talk about the projector as having a consciousness of its own and this consciousness is creating the projection and its unfoldments it lays down the laws uh this is also one of the reasons why it's it's a very important point because uh if we don't understand or uh, know this point uh we may uh uh you know make the mistake of believing that we are capable of more as we are than we are see in other words uh the laws of matter the laws of matter seem to be i mean we have we have two uh notions about the laws of matter one lo- notion is that nothing can break them nothing can change them they're fixed forever see this is the law of the earth and law of matter is the law of death the iron law as it is called uh nothing can change it and then the other side is that there is a divine spirit inside us and therefore divinity is possible to us and that divinity can push the boundary of all the laws including the laws of matter and we can change the laws of matter uh both of these views are uh Are, are problematic because on the one hand we are saying that we cannot change the laws of matter but if the divine dwells in us why can't we change the laws of matter so this has been one of the arguments by certain mystics and then the other one is that the divine dwells in us so we can change the laws of matter but we have we don't know the conditions under which these laws can be changed and so this is exactly where the lid of that craftsman magician comes in under whose aegis under whose law the supermind um, the, the psychic being is expressing so until and unless we can equal that law and exceed it we are unable to change its laws well i, I Ex- exceed that consciousness we are not unable to change its laws <clears throat> this may be a little off the wall but on un- as it descends as there's a descent yeah the, the overmind is is creating these separate realities and then projects into that reality and splits into separate performers doing different performances right. so that's happening on the as it on the descent but as it ascends is there some sort of recognition that it's performing in a play that was set up 
by an aspect of its own nature? Yeah, there is. And that's the reason why, I mean, but what what is descending is not just overmind. So overmind is creating the possibilities of these 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 three layers and the different players and all that. This is what one might call prakriti and the evolution of prakriti. But what is also descending is supermind itself. The supramental purusha is actually even more than that. The ananda purusha. And you, you all have read that chapter called The Divine Soul. The Divine Soul is actually the one that is descending into each one of the possibilities that are the fragmented individuals. And so each individual is not just a descent of the overmind, but contains in itself the possibility of the entire Satchitananda supermind. You know, you can call it a fourfold, Satchitananda Vigyana. That entire foursome is present in inside under the ages of overmind. Because it is greater than overmind, it can recognize the fact that this that, that there is something. If that it if it was not greater than overmind, it would not be able to recognize it. You see, it's it would not be available to it. It would be under the wall of overmind but it has a remembrance beyond the overmind. This is the remembrance that allows it go, to go beyond the overmind. Thank you. So in the Kena Upanishad, since uh, there are, I mean, anybody can jump in at any time. So, but I'm just reflecting because we've opened up this particular area. Uh, you know, the Kena Upanishad talks about these three births. These are the three gods that each of them, you know, then the, the, the setting of the Kena Upanishad is that these three gods and they, they come one, after the other, you first have Agni, uh, and in this case, Agni represents the presence of divinity in matter. And Agni uh, tries to burn this blade of grass because there's somebody, some power that challenges its power to burn. In other words, where do you get your law from? What the, the basic law with which you do, whatever you do is being challenged by something that claims to be beyond it. It cannot burn unless this power allows it to burn. And so it's challenged. And then another power, another God comes. This is the God Vayu. This is the second birth, the birth of the vital. So you have the physical and then you have the vital. And the same thing happens. It goes through the same process. It cannot blow away the blade of grass. And then you have Indra, who is the god of the mind consciousness. And the god of the mind consciousness also cannot operate by the, through the challenge, due to the challenge of this, this power. But it can voice its question. This is the thing about... You, you, you know, remembering, as you were saying, this idea of remembering that something has descended and in its ascent can go back to its source and even go beyond its source. Uh, there is something in us which is the psychic being which remembers, but in our nature constituents, this remembrance is not full fully achieved until the mind consciousness appears in, in matter. So this is the reason why Indra is the only one of the gods who follows in the track of this being, follows in its track, though it has disappeared, and reaches up to the highest peaks. 
and sees that there is a goddess there who points beyond, points above. And that's all that, that that's how the Upanishad ends. But essentially, this following in the track of the Brahman, this, this uh, you know, opening up of the question, the questioning of uh, what it is that is the, you know, the universe, the cosmos. What has brought us into the cosmos? What is our throne condition all about? You know, the mind pursues that because the mind releases a power of Purusha that is more free than the power of Purusha in matter and life, that the, the amount of the, 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 the binding that has taken place. Uh, you know, these are the three, three ropes by which we are bound to the sacrifice. Um, you know, the image of... Uh, the, the, in, in Shaivism, you have, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Pashu. The Pashu is literally translated as the animal, the animal of the sacrifice. But the word Pashu uh, really means the one that is bound, because Pasha is literally a rope that binds. So it's bound thrice. It's bound in its material a reality, it's bound, these are the three births, in its vital reality and in its mental reality. And the binding in the material and vital is so tight that the psychic or the soul in that is operating in these uh, layers cannot break free. Uh, you know, it can become strong enough. It isn't that grace cannot come to us at the vital or the physical level, but it cannot break free on, of itself because its degree of freedom is so constrained. Mind has more breathing space for the Purusha. And the Purusha is more free to question, to actually follow in the track of this ascent. Uh, what is it that has brought me into this descended projection? Can I can I do a follow up question? Please, please, I, please. Um, I just want to backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, correct me if I, I mistook you, but you talked about something that this uh, master, um, this magician craftsman, is creating is logical forms. Yeah. So. Uh, before the descent, the supermind can be A and B at the same time. Once the, right. once the ascent has uh, occurred through these various levels and their thresholds, it's, it seems to me that once these are A, the law of exclusion starts to apply. So A cannot be not non-A. Um, right. So there's an, it sound, I, I may be um, paraphrasing or distorting this a little bit, but it seems like a kind of divine amnesia is applied. Yes. And that this amnesia is, is lifted as the ascent occurs. Correct. And these thresholds, Absolutely. you have to eventually meet this magician, craftsman. Right. Sort of right. face to face. And right. the reversal that happens. So you realize... Right that what you've been protesting against in this uh, world of form with all of the, right. the, the, the different kinds of logics uh, right. that have been applied, there's a, a breakup of those logics. Hopefully some sort of, um, it seems like sort of a pair of consistent logic might start to be worked with at these levels um, or something. Um, I'm just curious though, once this has been negotiated or this threshold, right. the ascent has occurred, Right. Then you uh, presumably are still operating in the physical material world. You're talking about the vital right. and the material um, still can um, make claims mm -hmm. uh, in the world of form where, where these different, uh, where, where a certain identity is, is uh, sort of stamped on the person, but that that psychic right. being can remember this mm. experience. 
right. and can then operate or function in a, in a, in a more optimal way for, for himself and for others. I, I, I get the feeling this is what Aurobindo is up to. It's not just about ascending and going into uh, ecstatic no. bliss, but there's a secret well, ecstasy he talks about. That everyone yeah, yeah. has to guard or protect because it may not be um, appropriate to, uh, to blast everybody away with your magnificence. <laughs> no, no. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's exactly, that's one of the major, you know, differences, where it's not, not just an ascent, but a re-descent. Uh, you descend again with that consciousness. And it isn't a descent that brings you back to what you were, because you've transformed now. Uh, the status of the consciousness is completely changed. So the psychic being, which is under the constraint of the law of overmind, uh, you know, as you very well pointed out, rises in consciousness till it is face to face with its maker, as it were. And it's really not the maker because the psychic being is the maker of that consciousness. In a way, the divine consciousness is what is ascending. And it recognizes the fact that this is the device by which I have bound myself. This is what it recognizes. I have come face to face with the control tower in which I have put the device by which I have bound myself and I can become this device. I can become the consciousness of this device. This is where the first of the merging take place. The psychic being, it is really the mother was asked the question, who undergoes the triple transformation? She said, it's the psychic being that undergoes the triple transformation. The psychic being starts from being the bound individual to the individual that knows itself to be equal to the power that binds to the individual that knows itself to be greater than the power that binds. And in knowing that it is greater than the power that binds, it can change the laws of the binding. It, that's, that's one of the most revolutionary things that Sri Aurobindo is talking about. He's talking about changing the conditions of the uh, earthly binding, of the bondage, by rising to supermind. And even if one person does it, it becomes possible to change that for the entire cosmos. So once the possibility, the matrix, as it were, has changed, then others can also follow in its track. There's a really interesting uh, conversation that takes place, uh, and it's quoted in this book. Uh, I think a really interesting book, uh, some of you may have come across, uh, called um, Babaji and the 18th Siddha Tradition by Marshall Govinda. Has anybody come across this uh, book? I think I've had some. Yeah, Don, yeah. So, so this, in this book, yeah, Marco as well, yeah. So in this book, uh, he quotes, he, he quotes Sri Aurobindo as saying that he came to the conclusion uh, through his own yogic, uh, you know, travels and uh, experiments that there were others that have achieved uh, either degrees or great parts of the supramental consciousness and maintained in, in, it, in themselves through yogic power, through power of yoga. And then he says, my aim, however, is not to do that just by power of yoga for oneself, but to bring it down as a possibility for the earth, to bring it down as a possibility for a mutated sort of condition on earth. And that is really the whole notion of changing the cosmic condition, the condition of this, the, the laws by which the bondage is maintained. And, and could this does not change, change, but what it means is that the possibilities have changed and individuals will be able to achieve these other conditions within the cosmos. And Sorry, can you, yes. 
Can you relate that to the knot? So uh, th this passage about the knot and its relationship to the suffering and the, it, it seems to me that it's not unrelated what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, kind of, I kind of think of the knot as, I think of Cohen's line, the crack that lets the light in. It, it's a, yeah. it, it has that double purpose of both connecting to the right. light and to the, to the suffering and the harder things. Exactly. The knot, the knot, which is sometimes referred to the, as the guardian knot. The guardian knot was this, the story of the guardian knot or, or, you know, arises in the life of, uh, of Alexander, who uh, in this Western heroic way is supposed to have uh, cut the guardian knot with his sword. Nobody else would cut it and Alexander cuts it. But, this is an irony. It's really ironic because the mystery of the guardian knot is not in its cutting. The mystery of the guardian knot is in the knot. This is it's a very important uh, metaphor. The idea of the knot is the inextricability of the cosmos. The knot is the fact, you know, it's these very intricate designs that Islamic art shows you in its geometry. You know, the Every individual is really inextricably tied to everything else. And this design is the knot. It's the single multiple knot. This knot is the overmind. This is the transition between supermind and overmind. And the knot is really the knowledge that this overmind is a subsidiary function of the supermind. Those who come to that knowledge they understand the knot and they can either unravel it and create it anew or they can exist within it and be free within it, which is the idea of Jivan Mukti. This is the knot. Uh, so can we uh, say that the difference, or I mean, maybe you already said that in some form or another, but I try to rephrase it to see if I understood it correctly. The, one of the main differences between supermind and overmind is it that in the supermind, you have no principle of division, you have perfect unity, whereas at the level of the overmind, you have a first principle of division, of duality, of fragmentation, and which expresses itself also in the manifest universe, also as a, at a material level, I would say also physically as particles, for example. Would you see this picture this point of view in the writings of Sri Aurobindo, or am I here <laughs> making a bit of confusion? Uh, yeah, Marco, you, that what you're saying is partially right, but it's also not partially right, because the supermind is not a consciousness that has no division within it. So the term Vigyana it's an interesting thing. The, the possibility of dividing itself already exists in supermind. And this hardens in overmind. This is what it is. Yeah. The undivided consciousness is the Satchidananda. But mm -hmm. from the Satchidananda to the supermind, the supermind is like the, it, it is really the divine mind. The reason Sri Aurobindo doesn't use the term divine mind very often is he doesn't want it confused with mind consciousness. But mm. the reason why it is the divine mind is that because it has the possibility of creating ideas, of dividing. You see. But the divisions of supermind don't bind it because it knows that it is the one that is becoming whatever it is becoming. See, While mm. overmind creates these lines in which it binds the cosmos, the, it, it really hides the oneness. It's, it's as if, so first there is the one, then there is 
super mind, which actually has the one and the many together. And then there is over mind, which creates two sides of the one and the many. The one becomes the not one and the two can't coexist. So what happens with super mind over there is that um, that's the reason why it's called the Vigyana. Vigyana and Vigyana is the primary knowledge operation of super mind. The term Vigyana is the term Jnana, which is Gnosis. You know, it's the same root in, in Greek, uh, g or gnu, root, root, which is the root of knowledge in the, uh, all the Indo-European languages. And the prefix V, the prefix V means specialized. So there is already a specializing property within oh, supermind. Supermind can divide, can create special mm. formations, but its special formations don't lose their knowledge of themselves as being self-formulations of the one. While by an act of concentration of consciousness, it can hide that equation between the one and the many and hold that. That's why overmind is really a concentration of the Lord. It's a tapas, a concentration of the Lord, whereby the Lord is holding the many separate from the one. That's it. And the separate, you know, the fragments that you're talking about feel themselves to be separate. This is also interesting that, you know, you find this knowledge of separation. Uh, you know, the ontology of separation is experienced by even human beings differently, de depending on the psychology. Uh, you know, when, when I, I, I mean, if I may share my, just my own experience, when I came to the West from India, uh, this was one of the first things I noticed the first time I came to the, as soon as I came into Europe, I noticed I could ex I could sense that an individual's experience of himself or herself was much more individually distinct than mine or, 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 or any Asians, including say the Middle Easterns. I had come from the Middle East on my way. There's a difference in consciousness. And the difference in consciousness is because the sense of separateness is being held by every layer of the consciousness. And yeah. in the mind, it becomes really very distinct. And the mind makes us, uh, we accept ourselves to be individuals. And the monetization of the prakriti becomes really separate over there. That's why... In the Indian psychology, you have ego residing uh, under the intelligence, under the buddhi, ahankara, the eye maker. So that's really the ego operating through the mind, the mental ego that creates this really strong sense of being separate. While actually you can exist as a monad and not be that separate, and then if you go beyond overmind, you know that you're not separate at all. You are the one who is specializing itself. Devashish, I just I love that description of the difference of the. This is more me as a psychologist. The difference sure. of the um, Asian and Middle Eastern and European Western personality. Um, right. I'm, sure, I'm sure you remember this. There's a wonderful long letter Sri Aurobindo wrote describing the difference over several thousand years in the Indian differentiation of intuition and intellect and how it remained to a large extent integrated in the West, it, the, the separative analytic intellect began to become more and more apart. And I know a lot of people here are familiar with Ian McGillicrist who writes, I think very interestingly, using um, modern neuroscience research and using really as a metaphor the left and right hemisphere, describing, I think, the same phenomenon that... Interesting. This, this intuition, this intuition yeah. that 
Yeah, that unites that unites the self with others. Right. Right. Separated That's, more in modern times. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that's good to know. Yeah. But even as a pure perception, I mean, growing up in India and I've experienced this even going back, because when we talk about cosmic conditions, uh, our, our collective condition is also determined by an overriding ontology that comes into existence due to maybe a critical mass or the history of a certain people that really set it in place. And this was very interesting. I mean, not only how individuals looked and uh, just my interaction with individuals, but going back to India, and now I'm here, my experience of nature is different. There isn't that kind of sense of a, you know, third dimension to that great an extent. It is as if there is something much more, uh, I mean, there, there isn't that uh, strong sense of the third dimension of, of distance. While when I go to the West, nature uh, appears much more clearly distinct. Uh, and I've wondered about that. And I think it's that that's basically what it is. It's, it's a collective ontology that you experience things differently. I think I think it was Owen Barfield. We've talked about him before. Um, he said that modern, pre, he said uh, pre-modern peoples often experienced the world as a garment that they wear, whereas modern people treat the world as a platform upon which they stand. So I was. Uh, when you were talking about that, your experience of moving from Europe back to uh, India and being very sensitive to those subtle ways that people have of holding the vital and the, the material right. and relationship to nature. Um, right. That there, and, I th and I think we've all felt that as we've traveled, that there's something in the, in the uh, field that has an effect on right. it. I think that, could that have some relationship to what you, what you mentioned as the trans individual, that the trans individual, I think in Simon Don sort of talks about this, sort of emerges out of this field. Yeah, that we, yeah, yeah. That we all participate in. Yeah, trans and individuation, exactly. Trans individuation is, there are two levels of trans individuation. One is exactly what you're talking about. We participate in this collective reality. So we are not just an individual that's in a single body, but we are uh, the entire collective to some extent. We are spread in that sense. Uh, but also we create structures. We create grammatical structures that, 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 that uh, you know, by which we agree upon our world. And these grammatical structures also become ontologies. They become collective ontologies by which we experience a collective life or collective individuality in fact and that that's what that's what he's talking about in a way how we create that limits our possibilities and expands our possibilities so i know but this is not to say uh, it's, uh sorry jeffrey just one uh thing i wanted to say that you know so, what is often the tendency is to, if one recognizes that this kind of hardening of a individuality as a modern phenomenon or a Western phenomenon, there is sometimes a romanticizing of the pre-modern or a romanticizing of the non-Western that occurs. And I think it's important to uh, kind of not fall into that trap either. These are different ontologies, we are bound nevertheless. Uh, we have to, you know, I mean, the, the important thing of recognizing this is that to some extent it's relative. And, you know, just like Don pointed out, it's important for us to bridge even the inner realities so that the mind does not 
you know, kind of hold its image of itself, uh, you know, the modern image of, of the human, which is really a temporal image, uh, you know, so that we can be more whole, even within the ignorance, even within the, the bondage of the three, you know, layers, and then take that further. Um, my question, so I have, a, while I'm listening to you speak, Devashish, I find that, uh, first of all, you sound like a physicist. <laughs> uh, the way you talk about binding, it's very mm. interesting, and the relationship between binding. So I'm interested in the whole thing about immanence versus transcendence in the writings of Aurobindo. And when I listen to you, it sounds very imminent the way you talk about this. Um, although when I read Aurobindo, it, it, it sounds or feels a bit more transcendent. So I'm a bit yeah. curious about the relationship between those two. No, that, 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 that's a great question, Jeffrey. And I think uh, maybe the reason why uh, you think that I sound more imminent is because uh, I've, you know, I think, I think uh, philosophies of becoming. Well, okay, let me back up. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, when Sri Aurobindo was writing, he was writing in the uh, style of, of, of what I call modernism. You know, and what what we are th seeing today is a different style, even in terms of philosophy, which is really the postmodern style. And Postmodern style is something which, uh, you know, uh, bridges, does exactly what we are talk, talking about. It, it tries to bridge these separatenesses. But when Sri Aurobindo was writing, he was writing in a collective milieu of literary style as well. And so you find that when he writes philosophy, he writes philosophy. When he writes psychology, he writes psychology. When he writes social thought, he writes social thought. Uh, just a moment. Yeah. So uh, what has happened as a result, to some extent, is that people either just read the life divine and then they get this sense of a greater, more great transcendental feeling to his writings. Or they read the letters or the synthesis of yoga and they get a more imminent feeling from his writings. Or they read his, very few people read his social writings. And if they do, then they get this more sort of social and political feel from thought from his writing. And I think what one of the evolutions in literary style that has taken place today is the ability to be all these at the same time. Can we have a style of writing? I think it begins with somebody like Heidegger, you know, who is trying to locate the individual in the collective and talk about the two at the same time. Uh, and even when we talk about somebody like uh, Simon Don at Deleuze, where they're talking about trans individuation, you know, so how can we talk about the individual and the collective at the same time? How can we talk about the transcendence and the immanence at the same time? You know, to, to retain the, uh, you, you know, categories uh, in a language, to create, to fashion a language. And I think this is part of what Sri Aurobindo is talking about in terms of the future poetry. This is also part of the future poetry. He was getting at it through certain devices like meter, rhythm, and that's partly, you know, uh, why Matteo was giving this kind of uh, importance to the singing and the voicing of these uh, these lines, the mantric lines, mantras. But partly it's also fashioning a language which can in its grammar and in its its syntax and you know in its voicing uh, keep all these different uh, categories uh, together instead of taking them apart. So I I feel that's 
partly what my, part of my effort in, in, in speaking and writing is to do that. Perhaps you're catching on to that. But the imminent, the importance of the imminent is really because if we are to value our existence existentially and not metaphysically, this is another one of the divisions that's taken place, which is uh, metaphysics can give us great edifices of understanding, uh, but they may remain armchair realities. But if we are to take our reality first and foremost existentially, then the imminent becomes our gate of approach to the transcendent. And that becomes where we are grounded in our language as well. Thank you. That was beautifully said. There was. I have a question about yes. the, the world in the sense of being in the world. Yes. That, would be experienced by a higher consciousness, a overmind or, or supermind. Because as a, as a human, I have a very rich world. Countless objects, relationships, earth, sky, multidimensionality. It's, it's incredibly rich. Right. Uh, and even when, I, when people speak about subtle experiences, dream experiences, lucid dreaming, psychedelics, etc. The descriptions are yeah. usually based upon a world. However, right. and now I'm reading Aurobindo for the, for the first time, uh, so I'm not familiar sure. with his, his other writings, so I'm getting this particular uh, flavor, sure. flavor of it. When I um, read his descriptions of overmind, supermind, uh, they don't seem to have worlds uh, associated with them. And Yet, because of the way that involution and, and evolution works, there is an aspiration toward them. Uh, mm -hmm. And they aspire through us toward themselves, presum presumably. Mm -hmm. So the knot that I've been twisted in a, a bit mm -hmm. has been around the aspiration for mm -hmm. a trans world, transcendental maybe, tying into Jeffrey's mm -hmm. question, type of experience. When, mm -hmm. as I understand Aurobindo's description of supermind, over, mm -hmm. through, supermind acting through or manifesting through overmind, there's, mm -hmm. there's an intentionality to create mm -hmm. ignorance, to create the conditions for the possibility of multiple forces working out their mm -hmm. possibilities mm -hmm. and in that process creating, creating mm -hmm. worlds, creating the world that we experience. But this becomes then a realm of potential suffering, of evil, of darkness, uh, of um, experiences that we don't want. Uh, but, or did we, <laughs> is, the, is kind of the question that I have, and kind of the knot that, yeah. that I'm experiencing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful question. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it is not true that supermind does not have world or words, or experiences of words, or experiences of relations among the entities in its words. It has a world just like our world, but it experiences it differently. The supermind is a existence which parallels our existence. It is already and eternally there. We are another kind of a existence, which is evolutionary and moving towards that existence. Some may ask the question, why then do we have to have suffering in a world of evolution if this world of perfect relations already exists? And the answer is that this is another kind of experience. Supermind does not lose its perfection while we learn what it means 
to learn anew, to have something for the first time. So coming back to your question about the, you know, about the words, I think that the, the richness that you were talking about, the experience of a supramental earth will not abrogate this relationship, this world of relations. Only the experience will be different. It'll be one and many at the same time. See, one of the problems we have with oneness is that we think about it in our finite terms. It's as if, uh, you know, there is only one. And then if we look at somebody else, that, that, that of something else is the same as me. And so in a sense, it's already known. Right? But in fact, the one is infinite. You know, the, the idea about an absolute consciousness is that the one is in eternal wonder about itself because its own horizons are not known to it. So every entity that we experience, every relation that we experience has this richness, as you said very rightly, because we don't know. We don't know who the other is, and we, we are discovering and experiencing, exploring and delighting in our relations. But that does not get at all, uh, you know, erased. What happens instead is that that is heightened in the experience of the one coming to know its own infinity. Can I ask a quick question, Devashish, about what you yeah. just said to Mark? So would you say it's not that this becomes one and many, it is one and many, but we don't know. Yeah. Right, right, right. We don't know it because of the because of the tapas of overmind. And if we did know it, and that's that's what the yoga is all about. And that's why the supramental world of relations already exists and always exists. It's, you know, in that you may have come across that dawn. And some of you, I'm sure, you know, Matteo, I don't know, if Marco has read that passage in the agenda where the mother talks about the supramental ship. And the first thing she says in that description is that she came to this realization that the supramental world has always existed and she has always had an existence in it. This is that parallel perfect universe that, that's always there. It's, it's, the, it's the world of relations where the experience is different, but it's not a world without, ex, without relations. It's not a uniform oneness it's many and one at the same time experienced as many and one at the same time this ties back in so beautifully to that passage in the kenna upanishad that you're talking about because it starts out saying that the eternal conquered for the gods and in the victory of the eternal the gods grew to greatness but then the folly of the gods was, this was what they saw, ours the victory, yeah. ours the right. greatness. And then the right. eternal challenged them to do one off until Indra was brought, split out of that reality and told in the victory of the, it is the vic in the victory of the eternal in which ye shall grow to greatness. So it's that realization coming. It's so beautiful. And also, it's interesting going back, bringing in the Isha Upanishad also. The, the invocation is to Agni to remember. Yes. Oh, will remember that which was done. Right. Remember. Absolutely. Like getting, getting, bringing the realization into matter. Right, and right. Invoking matter to remember. Right, right. Yeah. It's also what you started with, Matteo, which, which is the strength that is in each of these births, that that is the strength. The ultimately, Agni in the Kena is being used in a specialized way to refer to the power of the, the solar power and matter. 
but actually Agni is lit in all the words. And it's really that is, which is the strength in that Vamadeva hymn that you were referring to right in the beginning, uh, which is the will. And Sri Aurobindo is very clear about this when we talk about epistemology and in the yoga of knowledge, that knowledge is not primarily knowledge by the mind of the things of the mind, but knowledge is primarily by the will of the things of the will. And that is the psychic agni. Would you mind elaborating um, what you or our bindo means by, by will? Because I feel that this is one of the concepts that you know, we find in Nietzsche or in Schopenhauer. It is. But which... In it's very Nietzschean. I think Nietzsche represents a, a kind of like a, a, a turning in Western philosophy for this very reason that he connects with people like Heraclitus and the pre-Socratics in, in this notion of the will. The, 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 the will to power is really the will to self-exceeding. It's the will that is seeded. It's the fire that's seeded into matter. And that really is causing the evolution to take place. And whatever, you know, if, if our seeking, if our mental uh, a, a need for mental understanding is stuck at the level of, you know, just normal knowing, you know, knowing uh, jigyasa as the, the Sanskrit word, which is really knowing for the sake of knowledge, right? Uh, something is lost because there is something else. It's, it's an existential will to go beyond, to understand and, and, and transcend. That is... Uh, behind, that should be behind even our knowing. It is very Nietzschean. And, and th there's no doubt that there is a strong Nietzschean component to Sri Aurobindo. In fact, the word Superman is, you know, a direct kind of uh, in transmission from there. Nietzsche, again, coming back to transcendental and imminent, Nietzsche is the great philosopher of imminence. Philosophy of becoming begins with Nietzsche in our modern times. And I think Sri Aurobindo today has to be read like that because otherwise there is a tendency to read him in metaphysical terms and not really catch the drift of his revolutionary intent. I think... For me, that's one of the areas where I've been a, a bit thrown off reading this text because I was more trained in continental philosophy and in the sort of post-metaphysical deconstructive um, move mm. where a concept like right. will or being or knowledge with those capital letters would um, be put in brackets in some way or would be contextualized in, in terms of culture, politics, economics, etc. Et um, and I know that there yeah. are those dimensions to Aurobindo's thought, that he was a, a social and political yeah. thinker, as yeah. well as a metaphysical uh, and a spiritual thinker. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that's where the translation really helps and where your work has been very helpful. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's important that translation is really important in our times for the very reasons that you're speaking, about what you're saying. These are changes that have occurred over time. And continental thought has come in and has been a bridge between science and philosophy because that, that's the real crisis, as Husserl pointed out, right? The crisis in modern knowledge takes place because science claims the right of philosophy and becomes the overriding ontology of modern knowledge. but. What uh, I think that's that's the reason why we need that translation today. And uh, Sri Aurobindo can definitely be read like that because he's primarily a yogi, and a yogi is really a empirical scientist. A yogi starts from the ground and moves towards the transcendence. While with what he's doing in the life divine, to some extent, is the reverse of that. But it's really how he got there. To say what he's saying, that is of greater importance. And actually, if you read between the lines, that's what you find. 
that's what he's trying to do to point to the, the yoga that's uh, kind of really the act of will by which we get there. Thank you very much, Demashish. I have to go. See everybody. Okay. Okay, Don. Nice seeing you. Well, if if I may connect to well, it's it's more a statement than a question, but you can elaborate eventually on this. Uh, returning back to the principle of unity and diversity, where I understood better, I would like to, to know if you agree or not, uh, th this principle was not in the life divine, but in the ideal of human unity, where he describes how the principle of unity must not be misunderstood as a uniformity, but a unity in diversity. And once I understood this at the social level, because after all, it's a social, social psychology, what he's talking about in, in, the, in that book. Then returning back to the other writings, also to the life divine, I it clicked, in, at least for me. Huh? And, and I understood better the distinction between a unity, which our mind, our, well, sense mind, I would, or, or our physical mind would see as a flattening of everything and everyone and a unity which is still a unity and yet extremely plastic, extremely ha having an extreme variety, but without contradiction, without contradicting the fundamental unity. Would you agree that reading the idea of human unity, you, you understand this point better or is it only my <laughs> is it only my experience i don't know if it's I, I think that's really nice uh, marco that you know that that it happened like that for you uh, mm -hmm. uh and that's why i was saying that not many people today read these social texts but they're very important and i think yeah. it's really great that you it, it it took that kind of a turn for you that you read that and that illuminated is you know other writings uh, i think it's important to to see that those parallels that you just pointed out i, I don't think everybody sees may, may do that like you said i mean uh, uh the the way in which you understood maybe uh, i don't know i don't know that that remains a question your question is a good question i really don't know the answer whether I, I, can, would also I can say the same thing happened to me, Marco. Reading the ideal of hum, human unity helped it click. Yeah, right. Definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's really, really important to read these different texts because that's that, that's the thing that today we're trying to fashion a language. You know, philosophy itself is never far from being social philosophy. From being political philosophy, uh, you know, metaphysics in and for itself is uh, no longer given that importance. Uh, it's treated as speculative. Well, what while well, what he's doing is not speculative. It's uh, really the sort of bridge between his own e empirical experiment experimentation and a kind of a metaphysical structure. Uh, but I think it's really important to look at his social philosophy, to look at his psychology and, uh, you know, kind of treat it as an experimental field, uh, you know, in which uh, what he's kind of his, his own quote unquote discoveries are, 
like a map of the terrain that we carry as legacy, but that we have to map for ourselves in experience. One of the things I noticed while reading Aurobindo is that he uh, cites the science of his day. He seems to be very aware of what the current science, he talks about the Gestalt and things related to the Gestalt school. There are a couple of other things I picked up. And one of the things that interests me about Aurobindo is to, um, so you, you mentioned this idea that science has sort of overtaken the whole ontological issue and and we agree that this is not not what needs to happen but but the alternative to to neglect science is not an option either and so i what i'm trying to sort of coax is is or look at is is a way of reconciling or a window to contemporary science as opposed to the science of his day. Uh, so I, I don't know whether you have any thoughts about that as a program. Yeah, you know, so there is a lot of uh, writing and thinking now about, uh, you know, contemporary science and uh, consciousness. You know, there's a lot of conferences going on. And you have ions, you know, and, uh, you know, science, science and consciousness and all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, I, I think it's important to bridge these, to be able to talk. But I think a lot of what is happening today is speculative and it's really a jump uh, from, you know, kind of certain types of paradoxes that have emerged in physics to positing the reality of consciousness, etc. That that particular track doesn't interest me that much. It, it's not necessarily true what the, the jumps that are being taken by people like Amit Goswami and you know a lot of the other people who are in that field uh, are not, you know, it's 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 Yes, there are paradoxes that have emerged, and it's important to realize that. But these are paradoxes that show the fact that our knowledge of matter is inadequate, but that's about it. What's beyond it uh, has to yield to another kind of examination than science. Thank you. I think we agree. Um, I find scientists tend to pick out very particular examples and then say, you know, we, this is an example of consciousness. And when you push it, you, you don't get that. So uh, I, I, right. I tend to focus a bit heavily on the wrong kinds of things. So. Right. So for, to give an example, you know, there's this whole idea of non-locality, the non-locality uh, principle and the experiments that have tried to show that when a particle splits, that in a way the, they move off in the kind of new uh, particles move off in different directions, but remember what each does. And this has been used to some extent to make a case for non-locality in thought, for telepathy, for example. And I think it just doesn't match. I mean, non-locality can occur at every level. But it doesn't mean that what occurs in matter proves anything in mind or that what occurs in mind proves anything in matter because the relations between mind and matter have not been established. I don't think it proves anything. I think it, there are their phenomena in their own right that are interesting and that open up new possibilities in their own domain. I agree, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. I'm a novice in the, all this. I think people like Marco are much more uh, the experts in this field. And so I defer to, uh, you know, the, 
the, the knowledge of experts in this, but this, this is just... Yeah, see, no, no, but, but I, I agree. I agree that, as you say, we have still not established the link between mind and matter. And, and these um, supposed links between quantum physics and mind are, at, at least at this stage, as what we know nowadays, are speculations not more right. than speculations and uh, we cannot uh, and there are frequent misconceptions about the supposed role of the observer in quantum physics and the things like that uh, it, it's not so easy to uh, reduce things at this level it is a misconception and but yeah. frequently also when i talk to the students of upr and and right. I tell them I, I tell them that there there is no such thing, at least not in this sense, as they would like to believe right. in right. quantum physics. Uh, yeah. They are disappointed. Yeah, they're very unhappy. <laughs> they regret. They they regret <laughs> that they, yeah. they, yeah, yeah. they have taken the course yeah, in they physics. The course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They came uh, expecting something. They came expecting that you'd be another Amit Goswami. Yeah, but yeah. You didn't. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, there is a um, core of truth because mm -hmm. this aspect that particles there can be considered, in quantum physics, you consider them not as two particles, but as, as a unique whole uh, until there is an interaction or what we call observation, what it's, which, which does not need the observation of a human yeah. mind or human consciousness, yeah, yeah. but just an yeah. interaction of also of other particles. Sure. And at least as we understand that nowadays, there is this idea of these particles that are w a single one, uh, until there is this, uh, they call it the so-called collapse of the wave function. And in some mm -hmm. sense, if we would like to stretch and make analogies, this reminds me what mm -hmm. Sri Aurobindo says in the knot of matter. In there, there, there are past passages where he effectively says Oh, okay, okay, now I, I don't remember exactly the words. I have to take this out. But where we can, if we want, see this uh, sort of description of quantum physical phenomena. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, therefore, I believe that maybe one day we will arrive at this point where we, 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 yeah. we will be able to make this connection, but we are not mm -hmm. there yet. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think, I think you're able to see that, uh, you know, much better than I can because of your training. But uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. Mm. Somewhere, you know, I think because we we jump to these speculations about the observer and about treating the collapse of the wave function as if it is some kind of a physical thing that our observation is collapsing and all that, which is really very muddy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which has caused a lot of confusion and, and, and uh, you know, strange uh, ideas to float about. Yeah. But if I might also add something from the psychological so social point of view, the problem is also that we are still in a phase where we are, mm, how do you say in English, R rising up walls, ide ideological walls. Mm -hmm. I more than once I tried to give the life divine in the hands of physicists and scientists, and uh, I was not very successful. <laughs> the, 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 what they want uh, is not 
a description which looks from the inside in towards myself inside looking in myself but they want uh, still um, final proof out there yeah? an external proof yeah? if there is no external proof they don't in there's still this um, uh, fear of listening to themselves to some inner intuition. Yeah? I would say Sri Aurobindo would have said um, listening to a, high, a sort of higher mind yeah? Yeah? Yeah. because I think there are scientists who have already some connection with the higher mind yeah. but, the, right. but they are afraid of it. They, they, yeah. they, have, they think they are devolving. There is, that this is a sort of involution. And, right, right. Yeah? So we still perhaps needs, I'm sorry to say if I'm so negative, uh, but still a generation of young, yeah. younger scientists who understand that this, this is not a way backwards, but it is a progression uh, towards yeah. a higher state of consciousness. Correct. I, I like how you said it's going up a wall. Maybe, maybe it can be the, the tedious phase that we have to go through. I'm thinking now of um, just technology in general. Like a lot of us right now are probably really hungry, but we're also wanting to continue the talk or whatever it might be. But um, I'm, I'm interested in the technological aspects. Um, we, at least I posted on the forum, the paper you did, the best use on technology a few years ago and uh, one of the talks you had posted online. and. Just wondering, we don't have to go into the paper as a whole. It's quite complex. Uh, goes over quite a few thinkers. I was wondering, um, maybe your thoughts or anybody else's thoughts on that, and where you, from that point yeah. of when you wrote then, where you are now. If anything's changed or more hopeful, uh, more utopian in your thinking, or or dystopian <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> No, actually, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that talk, that that the, the, the paper was more fleshed out than the talk. And uh, when I gave the talk, I, it was much more kind of ambiguous and amorphous. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, you, you know, people like Simon Don are talking about uh, possibility of the future, you know. And when you're saying about utopian and dystopian futures, there are passages which are utopian about the future in his writing, but there are, there's also a strange, a strong caveat, uh, you know, on where we could end up and which he feels very strong possibility that there might be a dystopian end to it. But I think much more than others, he feels that there could be a utopian end to it as well. And the reason he's doing the, that is that I mean, the, the basic foundation of his philosophy is that technology co-evolves with the human, that there may be problems to our relations with technology, but behind and underneath it, it's just like we're talking about the fire, you know, that the will, that, that will externalizes itself and to some extent becomes independent. And the evolution of technology has its own life. But ultimately, that life is a life linked to, to the evolution of the human. And what he's saying is that it starts to some extent influencing the evolution of the human and goes through these three waves. And, you know, the, 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 we're, as he calls it, the information age. And he was writing this in the 60s. The information age is really the age where... Um, you know, technology becomes soft and ultimately becomes virtual. And in becoming virtual, major changes occur uh, in, in its possibilities. Uh, but whether those possibilities will fulfill themselves is left up to human evolution. So they're linked in that sense. But when, the really interesting thing, the kind of very core visionary uh, the visionary 
the core of what he says is that we are in the mess that we are in in technology uh, because of the industrial phase of technology where we needed to we we moved towards this really greedy type of uh, production uh, mass production which brought with it you know the need to force desire on people for things that they may, never even had the desire because you have to have those things consumed that you've produced and you know the the, the large footprint it left on the earth and it's leaving on the earth the urban spaces that it created of concentration where people uh, just kind of deserted uh, you know the, the fields and kind of came to cities and ultimately uh, kind of became more and more concentrated into small spaces and basically what he's saying is that it's all this is really the state of the evolution of technology that is linked to the state of the evolution of the human but as it moves into the information age uh, that all these things could change there could be a gradual uh, relaxation of the human relation with technology that occurs and if that occurs then we could move into situations that are much more virtual in a sense that don't that the, the footprint of technology is not so evident that we live in closer harmony with nature that we produce what we need you know these things can occur through uh, new technologies of information and telecommunication this is the utopian age of what he's saying and you know if you're asking me uh, where i stand on this i'm looking more and more at communities like oroville for example for the uses they've made of technology you know uh, how can a community how can we reverse the equation of being slaves of a world that is already determined by you know the corporations to a world that takes charge of its technology and can that sustain itself in today's world of technology and i think the answer is more and more yes and it's it's you know the the innovative ways in which you can use what you need instead of having to use what is thrust on you is something which is really uh, amazing in our present world compared to even 100 years before yeah i guess in the future we'll all be some sort of luddites <laughs> with all sorts of random technologies no, no. But... i i don't yeah i don't think so i don't think <laughs> that's where we need to go but i i think i think we need to mm. be choosy about what Wonderful. <laughs> well, some would argue, I mean, at least with respect to certain technology caused problems like global warming, say, very top sure. uh, that we sure. already have the technology that we need. That's not the, the issue. It's not about yeah. <clears throat> developing better machines. Um, but it's more about the relationships and the kind of communication that we need to be able to have across diverse communities of, of human beings who live on and yeah. control that technology. Yeah. And, and that, oh, that's, that's it. That's why it. an experiment like Auroville is very interesting because it's a, a different kind of, in my understanding, I haven't been there, but it, I understand that it's a different kind of community. It's a different way of organizing human relations. Yeah. <clears throat> So that there's right. also a different relation between the humans and the technologies that they use. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's exactly the the idea, the, the point that I was trying to make. Guess what I meant? Instead of Luddites, I meant we'll be the, the shakers of the future. Or we'll <laughs> pick and choose our, our technology as long as it fits to certain standards. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'll stop there. I know it's uh, approaching almost two hours. I didn't know what Matei yeah, would have to. Yeah. I have to go because I have another meeting. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, thank, thank you, everybody. Debashish, if you thank have you. to go, if you have to go too, but thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Debashish. Uh, pr- much yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Matteo. It was yeah. enjoyable. I think I'll also take your leave. I think it's getting to just become morning here. <laughs> to move on. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well. Thank you very thank much, you. Devashish. Thank you. Okay. It's been it's been wonderful. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Good Thank questions. You. Enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, uh, before, uh, actually, to- Marco and Tony, uh, we haven't met you, uh, well, Tony over, over message, but uh, we've, in the previous talks, we've had a tradition of people introducing themselves, and we didn't really do that today because we sort of had a special guest. Um, and we're not quite to the top of the hour, so I'm willing to stay on if, if you wanted to. Just chat a little bit. Well, okay. So I present myself. Sorry if I didn't do it in the name. introduction. Great. But, uh, Great name. Sorry? You're Marco and I'm Marco too. Ah, yes. So <laughs> probably every time we have to specify who we intend to speak with. Uh, well, uh, I'm from Germany. Uh, I live in Germany. Actually, I am a bit, I'm born in Italy and then came to Germany. So uh, actually he is four (laughs) o'clock a.m. in the morning. Uh, And it's it's about many years now that I'm I'm reading Sherobindo, the mother also. And I'm quite interested in this. I knew Don and and also Debashis, Debashish, and so I found this 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 channel, and I decided to meet. Uh, well, from as profession, I used to be a physicist, and well, of course, therefore, I'm also very interested in the this debate science versus spirituality and so on, so on. So that it is a never ending story about which we could speak a lot, but without coming to a final conclusion, unfortunately, still not. Um, but yes, it's difficult to present myself. So you say you used to be a physicist. What yes, because also, this is a long story because I left this environment because I don't believe in it anymore. It is it's just too too tiny. There is too narrow-mindedness. Huh? Not only in this regards, not only what concerns the spiritual aspects which is not the main point but i think the our whole educational system is rotten <laughs> sorry if i say that so i left i used to work as a scientist at the university and then i was also a teacher in schools and actually i took a sort of sabbatical year so to speak and I'm writing a book on quantum mechanics. If someone is interested, I can send you a link. So that's it. Well, I know somebody who might be interested. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also used yeah. to be a physicist. <laughs> ah, you too. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you, I, I, you can be the proofreader if you, if you wish. <laughs> uh, Tony, uh, we've talked over message, uh, private message. I'm glad you can make it. And you're muted. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. 
Hello? Yes. Yes, okay. So, yes, I, um, uh, two years ago, I seen the, um, the uh, GAPSA meetings. And um, yes, that's where I find this channel. And I'm more or less coming to this from uh, the work of Ken Wilber. And um, well, I studied his uh, material for a few years. And I tried to read this book, uh, The Life Divine, like uh, five years ago or so. And uh, my initial thought was that I um, don't really have the background to um, understand this material because um, there's like half of half of that that I don't get because I don't know much about Indian culture and there's just um, just reading through the chapters. There's always this little introduction through the Rig Veda and um, well, I I don't have that. I don't have like this um, Eastern perspective. So reading it by myself, I probably wouldn't really get it. And um, so now, like, I mean, with the help of someone like Debashish, who I watched like on YouTube, um, you know, as the help of getting closer to this material, it's like quite an honor. So I, I read through um, I read through the first book. I got through this book like um, in the last uh, two weeks, and it's quite good. So it's very it's very uplifting. It's kind of like I don't know like I feel like I'm in this <laughs> in this dumpster, you know, like. Um, um, uh, looking at all the stuff like on uh, in the media and like reading this book is like um, you know ascending into some higher intuition that I have and you know um, I really I really like um, reading this material it's um, um, you know it's kind of touching something that I just intuited it's just it's like someone um you know expressing something that i only have an intuition for it's kind of like um uh, the john gapster stuff but um very dif very uh, different yes so that's that's how i came to this and i'm not a philosopher i do read some philosophy but i um not an acad academic or so Yes, and I'm I'm calling in from uh, Germany, like right between the border of um, Austria and Germany. I'm um, like um, uh, you know like south of Bavaria somewhere. Mm. It's uh, yeah. four o'clock in the morning where I'm. Well, it's quite some uh, dedication to, to get up this early um, for you. Yes, I tried it last time, but it, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't make it because it's very late. Mm. We've been doing these every week for the last six, seven weeks uh, at at this time, uh, but we also have a weekly dialogue, uh, not not just on Aurobindo on, on multiple different topics. I don't know the time zone exactly, but at noon mountain time or 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and I, I would like to pick up some themes that come up in these discussions, but don't get fully explored because of time limits or because of, you know, the different kinds of questions. Um, so just as an invitation, like uh, to both Marco and Tony, um, if you stay on the forum, you'll see when, when what's coming up and um, I would like to read Debashis's paper um, that, that Doug shared on individuation, cosmogenesis, and technology on Sri Aurobindo and Gilbert Simondon. I'm particularly in interested in the technology question as well, but more from the perspective of art, aesthetics, and the, um, the potentialities within those modes of 
those ways of knowing. Um, so just an open invitation uh, to to both of you and uh, you know, Frederick and Kim and Lauren as well, of course. You should know that by now. <laughs> um, yeah, so... And those are Tuesday afternoon, usually, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Well, I'm personally planning on... Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm personally planning to spend, um, you know, two days a week or so with this material, reading the life divine and also participating, um, you know, here in the forums and in the hangouts. So like two days a week, um, that's nice. I mean, I have like a lot of stuff going on. So, um, you know. Oh yeah. I know. <laughs> um, so it's just an open invitation. That's all. Um, and um, I don't know. We don't have a topic for Tuesday, so maybe we, we will do Debashisha paper unless something else uh, comes up. Um, so any other, I mean, before we go, any other? How are you doing, Kim? Yes. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for doing the, the forum and uh, organizing this meetups. Well, Thank it's, you. it's becoming a team effort. The more, the more, the better. Uh, J Jeffrey and Doug have also been helping out and a few people have been participating for quite a while, like John and um, Ed Mahoud, who, who's also, who's also in Germany. Uh, I don't know where in relation to you uh, specifically, but that's why he's not typically here at this time. Uh, he, he almost always shows up on Tuesdays. Though. And he's a Gibsarian. If you watch the videos, you, you know he's a he's a Gibsarian with, I think, a very deep reading of of Gebser and of spiritual texts uh, in general. Uh, so um, yeah, it's but it's a lot to take in. Like I find I, I, I what you said about it being uplifting. I find it it sort of is making me want to evolve. If that makes sense. Um, you know, in the kind of you must change your life kind of way. Uh, that's the overall message I get uh, from this. But I also resist that in, in various ways, um, perhaps just because. I think listening to Debush has completely changed my understanding of what I mean with Aurobindo. It's a very, very interesting way of looking at it, I think. For me personally, I feel um, when I read this last chapter, chapter 28 on the super mind for me it's more like i could find a real distance from life from my life from everything that's going on and you know that that's the effect that this uh, reading has to me so it's kind of something totally different and you know it kind of makes makes me um gives me kind of a gap between, you know, um, uh, what's happening in my life and what's happening around me, you know. Um, it's like, um, you know, reading about this higher potentiality, it's like um, you're, um, you know, looking down on, um, you know, whatever happen, happens around you. So that's my kind of, um, kind of the effect that this has on me. Marco, um, I really enjoyed having uh, Debashish's. I, I wasn't familiar with him before y'all started talking about him, I guess, last week. And I was late, so I kind of missed the conversation. And I'm just getting caught up, too, on the reading. But um, I struggled in the beginning to kind of, like, just get into the reading with all of the terminology, um, just because I'm not familiar with, the, I guess, the traditions that he's constantly referencing. So it's taken me a long time to sort of like build the language and 
get a feeling really. Um, cause for me, it's like more of a kinesthetic experience of like kind of matching my experience and seeing sort of if I have a, a relation to it from my interior, like that I can actually reference as something that I've, you know, can understand as real, um, versus like a concept. So it's been really slow. Um, cause more than most authors, I feel really challenged to sort of, I don't want to say measure, but sort of uh, maybe reinterpret sort of my experiences over the years um, and how I made meaning of them. So I'm sort of like, I feel like I'm kind of like doing a <laughs> sort of like a little bit of a system sort of uh, upgrade while I'm going through this and sort of like going back and like looking at moments in time where I like I have a memory around an experience and sort of reinterpreting it a little bit. Um, because I like the way that um, at least so far that I've, been able to piece together the meaning around what he's sort of um, putting together. I particularly like the the, um, the structure of it. It feels pretty full. Um, it, it also feels really challenging for me to uh, go beyond some of um, my own terminology or things that I've sort of like assumptions I've made about where I was at or what I experienced. And so in, in that sense, I really like it, but I'm struggling to sort of relate that to the group uh, and, and bring it back to like specific lines in the text. But um, there was um, some pieces and I think um, that was, she's talked just for a second and literally he mentioned it just like, um, cause he was all over, you know, the, the place in terms of um, touching on a, lot, on a lot of different topics, but talking about this sort of, um, you know, the, the, the vital and the um, like the consciousness piece like like sort of like these three tiers um, um, and, and kind of like getting a feel for like an actual feel for that um, and sort of like the, he, he when he talks about super mind he talks about like the second and the third and so I'm still kind of like lost in his um, like what the structure is but I, I I, I, I found that to be um, particularly engaging for me for some reason when he started to describe that. Um, I'll have to go back in the text and actually find it because I just have so many highlights. But that's kind of like, um, I mean, honestly, as you know, coherent as I might have just sounded, like that's kind of like where I'm at internally. I'm sort of like grappling with a lot of stuff, but I'm really enjoying the reading um, quite a bit. And I was really... Um, in, in this conversation enjoyed what Marco had talking about or had talked about in terms of like uh, sort of the gap between where we are in sort of what science like quantum theory, I guess might sort of imply might be true about mine, but it hasn't really proven. And I find that particularly interesting. Um, Marco, I don't know if you know, uh, uh, one of our American heroes is a guy named Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, He's an astrophysicist, and he was in Dallas a few months ago, and uh, he basically made fun of uh, people that uh, said that they had a sixth sense, and uh, like quite publicly in the audience, he's like, all right, who in the audience thinks they have a sixth sense? And then, of course, my hand shot up, and I was sitting near the front, so of course, he's like, oh, you, your hand went up really quick, and then he like goes on for like 10 minutes to completely trash people that have that um, worldview. So it was really funny. And then afterwards I got to actually meet him and talk to him and uh, we were doing like posing for a photo. And I was like, dude, I was like total existential crisis today with your attack on my sixth sense. And of course, you know, he had his arm around me for the picture and he just looked at me. And then I got like a 10 minute rant from Neil deGrasse Tyson. on like, why? I was so wrong. And um, I won't go into the whole thing, but it was actually a really instructive moment for me mainly just like sort of like being in total presence with him, listening to his sort of like argument, like drill a hole in my head. I could feel like this really passionate, like love from him, but also this sort of like, like coexistent disgust and sort of real concern for my well being that I actually believe that. <laughs> so it's this really funny experience with this guy. who's like, you know, this um, speaking of like collective, it's like, he's the, kind of the Pope of uh, astrophysics in, in, in the United States. And so I was getting his uh, darshan on uh, the sixth sense. And it was really good for me because just from a mental standpoint, like kind of really understanding where his argument was going and like how that type of mind would have to be convinced about 
that even being possible and where you drill down into. Um, for me, it was just a really great experience. And that came up a couple of times in the conversation, but mostly when you were sort of um, speaking about the, the gap, if I can even understand, because I'm not a physicist at all, but I, I find some of the concepts interesting just sort of based on what I've experienced. And um, so I'm excited to see where you're, what your research points to because that's a particular interest of mine, but just more from sort of a, a hobby standpoint. Anyways, thanks. I'm wondering if uh, German Marco, if you're going to add either Aro Bendo or Neil deGrasse Tyson in your, your quantum physics books now. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't understand your, que your question, but Neil deGrasse. I'm being silly. No, I'm, I'm asking uh, yeah. if you'll add Aro Bindo or Neil deGrasse Tyson, who she was just talking about, to your quantum physics uh, book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that he's um, more in the United States than in Europe. He's known as this, I know, I, I call them the popular physicists, which are very famous in the audience uh, among the people. But uh, when you go... I don't know in this case, but there are a lot of uh, TV show TV show physicists uh, who are who are very good and able to speak with the people, uh, but I don't I don't suggest to read them. <laughs> I suggest just nowadays we have YouTube. Go to YouTube. And find your physicist, not the TV star of the moment. Yeah? And and that's also because I I'm not very the Hawking type. Yeah? Hawking was also a very famous worldwide famous physicist, but uh, if you look at his ideas about philosophy. Hmm, about metaphysics, about anything that goes beyond the material. He was very, sorry, in my humble opinion, very narrow-minded. Huh? Um, Although Penrose wasn't. No, Penrose, Penrose, wasn't. Penrose I like Penrose, yes. Guy. Uh, yes, and, and, and he was a colleague, a uh, mm. student that, that were studying to the, together with, with, with um, but, Okay, Penrose is a quantum physics uh, mind consciousness guy. Huh? Mm. Uh, okay, yes. I mean, his but, ideas are maybe wrong, but they're interesting ideas. Interesting, yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah Hawking absolutely. was an atheist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not. It's not only the problem that they're atheists. The problem is that they are physicalists, mm. which um, is even more. I mean. Everything is biological, biomolecular, neuro, neuro, neurobiological. You're only a biological robot. And any attempt to go beyond a reasoning that goes beyond that uh, is immediately the shutdown. <laughs> well, and that's what I was referring previously to the problem yes. that we have an ideological problem. It is a psychological problem. Penrose is strongly criticized by the community for his ideas yeah. that go beyond the pale, yeah. too. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think Pen Penrose is one of the exceptions. Uh, he, uh, I think many people yeah. become reductionists. Sorry if I interrupt you. No, it's okay. Um, sorry. I think many people uh, get to a reductionist position because they see that it's just enough. I mean, sometimes you don't need more than just matter to uh, get through life, the same way that you don't need more than rationality to get through life and get maybe even successful. You don't need the paranormal, you only need the normal to, you know, get through life only, mm -hmm. and you don't need the transrational, you only need the rational. And um, I think for many people, uh, that's enough. And they don't want to go beyond that because 
they think um, that there's nothing really valuable and um, it's just enough. It's enough. It's enough to be uh, a, a physicalist. So that's, uh, I think, yeah. you know, the um, Shakespeare, how they see but the lady doth protest too much yeah. or something like that. Uh, because if it's enough, why do they get so riled up about people who have different beliefs? Like there's something that's disturbed. <laughs> you yeah. Know, no, but there, there are people who are, let's say, spiritual people and who meditate and then they um, have this kind of reductionist position where they say, okay, so, you know, you know, you, you just don't need more. You know, this guy, um, Thomas Metzinger, the neuroscientist, he's, he's kind of like this. I mean, he, um, he's a spiritual person and, um, you know, um, he doesn't like this, um, you know, um, Chalmers, um, ideas of, um, that there are like different ways of, um, uh, you know, um, exploring consciousness. You know, he thinks that, you know, just this uh, analytic, analytic, uh, modes of understanding, you know, those are enough. I mean, you don't need to go, uh, to go beyond that. Yes, but uh, you see, especially when it comes to the problem of consciousness, because this kind of attitude is justified in the purely physical sciences. Yeah, If you want to describe how a star functions in astrophysics, you, you don't need any spiritual, pseudo-spiritual theory. But um, when it comes to the problem of consciousness, I think... It, and with consciousness, I mean the so-called heart problem of consciousness, not just right. conscious. Yes. Yeah, you know, you know. I mean that kind of consciousness we are speaking about. Uh, it's now, despite the great progresses of neurobiology, neuroscience, and so so on. When it comes to that problem, there has been almost no real progress. And, and, and I'm speaking now after centuries, it's, it's since the times of, of Descartes, <laughs> when it comes to that problem, almost no, no progress. And that's why I say, it's my personal opinion, that we should begin to uh, open ourselves and ask maybe it's that science alone is not enough to e explain these kinds of things. Because if uh, century after centuries of philosophical debate and scientific research, there has been almost nothing, zero uh, uh, progress in this sense, what concerns this point. So we should question, maybe we need something else. The idea that we don't need uh, some external metaphysical force acting uh, to describe the orbits of the planets is okay. But to this, for this problem, I think, and here Aurobindo, I think, is very, very relevant, can tell us a lot of things. Well, Marco, we're, um, or at least I, I might be speaking for myself here, but I've already kind of looked at your paper online uh, just a minute ago, and it, it reminds me of Carlo yeah. Rovelli, who we explored a little bit, yeah. kind of his, maybe he's more of a popular guy. I, I don't know too much about the dynamics of each and every individual mm -hmm. um, one out there, but it, it looks like a good read, and I like your, your stance. Yeah. Everybody here kind of has... At least um, I'm not speaking for Frederick or, or Tony or a few others that I don't fully know all about and if they've been tied in with the university system or anything like that, but just mm -hmm. educational systems as a whole for this group tend to be something that's a blockage. And yeah, I, I know you'll like it, Jeffrey, if you get a chance to look at it. <laughs> I, I will. Uh, Marco and Tony, the new folks. 
Yeah. Okay. We we'll come again. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 All right. Good night, everybody. Good morning. Good night. Okay. Good morning. Good, good, night. Night. good morning. Good morning. Bye. Keep working on the hard problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will dream about it. <laughs> um, it about Rovelli, okay. Oh, okay. He's he's gone. Okay. So I'm enjoying this conversation, so I I have no. I mean, uh, I'm gonna go and have dinner and have. Yeah, yeah, I know, but but time. I'm I'm going now also because it's really <laughs> I didn't sleep any tonight. But about Rovelli is an interesting read because he at least he is a materialist and atheist, but at least he supports the idea that we should go towards a philosophical a, a meeting between science and philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's already a little step mm -hmm. in the right direction from, at least in my opinion, uh, sure. because until recently there was this idea that science is one thing, philosophy is another thing. They should not talk to each other. So. Mm -hmm. And that has caused, I think, a lot of problems. And, well, okay. I, I think just quickly, yeah. I, mean, I think Aurobindo might provide some way of, of understanding that if, if, you know, we take seriously the notion that there is a overmind or higher mind and, you know, he, he has different gradations, right? Overmind, illumined mind, or excuse me, overmind, intuitive mind, illumined mind, uh, higher mind. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the, the, the way in which one, level of mind or the mind itself, you know, it could be in dialogue. It commun can communicate with uh, the other kinds of mind or other forms of mind. Um, and through, through particularly intuition, that's what philosophy, I think, ultimately works with. It's, it's a reasoning out of intuitive, intuitive truths. Um, but it requires that intuitive connection or that intuitive channel uh, with those truths in order then to have the dialogue with, with reason. So even if a philosopher or a physicist like Ravelli is not fully on board with Supermind and Satchidananda and all these wild things, uh, if, if, he is, uh, if he is okay with intuition as being a, a valid um, way of knowing or a way of accessing information that then could be reasoned with, uh, in order to lead to new kinds of um, reasonings, new ideas. Um, and then, of course, if he wants to be empirical about it, those ideas could turn into theories, they could be tested in various ways, etc. I, mean, I think he would be open to the idea that we may not have the, the equipment, the technology, the methodologies to fully understand what may be communicated through intuition. Um, but, of course, that's encouraging. Uh, and I think it's at the level of thought, though. It, it's not an it's not an integral expression because it doesn't include uh, these other centers of being or other structures of consciousness that um, you know, are better explored through psychology, sociology, cultural studies, media studies, mm. and the other you know, disciplines. So that transdisciplinarity, I think, is, is very important. Uh, and, but it's, it can be difficult because there aren't, like you need institutional spaces to have Consist to have sustained transdisciplinary dialogues that can develop, that can grow into, into new forms of understanding. And I, my understanding is there are some spaces like that. Debashish mentioned the Mind and Life Institute and these kinds of collaborations that are happening between mystics and scientists. Uh, but as far as I know, in the mass kind of education, um, including, you know, university, elite universities, uh, you know, places that are seats of power, uh, and cultural power, uh, there could be a lot more division uh, than yeah. that really helpful or you, necessary for having that kind of conversation. Could, could I just say, uh, just kind of parenthetically, um, uh, this uh, idea of a split between philosophy and science and the two cultures, uh, in my experience uh, for a long time, that's mainly a limitation that I would associate with continental philosophy. In uh, Anglo-American philosophy, for the last 50 years, there's been very, very close relationship between philosophy and science, very close dialogue. 
And I would say that uh, here, at least, of, of, among all of the humanities, philosophy is by far the most interdisciplinary uh, discipline of all. Uh, philosophers work closely with uh, politics, with, uh, with psychology, with law, with uh, history, with, so with science especially. Mm. Um, so I think anybody looking for real resources, and a real track record, so to speak, of what genuine sort of philosophical engagement with science and other fields at the highest possible level should just look at the last 50 years of analytical philosophy, Anglo-American philosophy. Now, there's certainly been no uh, tension or split between those two worlds. At least. That's a good point, uh, because Continental has certainly gone more in the direction of literature, the arts. Um, and the history of philosophy. And, the, yeah, and its own history, um, critical theory, um, and, you know, politics you know, coming out of, you know, well, anyway, <laughs> yeah. coming out of many places, but I'm um, thinking of Marxism and uh, some of the more modern social political philosophies. Um, so, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, but, but I'm more of the, that, <laughs> more of the continental kind of side. Uh, so, and I had my connection is Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting about uh, maybe, I don't know, three-fifths of what you're saying. So, Okay, well, we should probably get going anyway. Something is happening here. Anyway, yeah. Great, great may, may I make two points here uh, quickly? Um, that the problem that between the, the split between science and philosophy, I think, comes much more from the scientists, not f so much from the philosophers. The philosophers with whom I have spoken with, I had no problem. They were very open, and uh, they would like to have this this connection. It comes more, I think, from the side. At least I speak now from the point of view of physicists, of theoretical physicists, especially. Uh, but they are people like Rovelli now are changing their minds now because they see that after half a century since the times of Einstein, they are trying to make this unified theory of uh, so-called quantum gravity, and uh, it, it didn't work out. It didn't work out, and now they are questioning why. Uh, and there is this current of Rovelli and others that say because we have followed this uh, philosophy uh, 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 of the so-called shut up and calculate philosophy. So no philosophy at all, only calculations. Mm -hmm. And it worked out for quite a good, quite good for a long time, but now it does not work out at least to, uh, uh, to the aims of this quantum gravity. And as to the problem of education. I agree absolutely with you, Marco. We have a big problem in our educational environment. I think we have still this idea, which we, we are speaking now. I think I'm 53 now. Uh, and it's uh, since I was a child uh, that I heard speaking about inter interdisciplinarity uh, or multidisciplinarity. But when it comes to the practice, uh, we still are divided in our uh, well, domains. Uh, it is very difficult to come out of that. And I think we have, in fact, to reconsider also our ideas, our assumptions about how these institutions work, how education work, on what assumptions education works. And um, yes, I think this is one of the problems to I have written also a book on that if someone is interested it means free progress education uh, so free it's, progress education yes okay. it's obviously a hint to integral education uh, integral education of um, integral yoga of uh, Sri Aurobindo and mother but it's it doesn't even mention them mm. it's uh, it's a secular point of view uh, but in its um, core, it is this, uh, the, the message. Mm. It's still in a self-publishing self uh, mode. Um, <laughs> it's still in search of a publisher, but anyway, 
if someone is interested, you can find it there. And in, I think this is one of the problems. We have still this educational environment which forms us since childhood to think in certain ways. And, and it is difficult to come out of that. Also for me, uh, I see this. I, I remember as well, when I was a child, I had a very intuitive view uh, of the physical world. And I was very intuitive, an intuition that I have lost as grown up, as, uh, yeah, as an adult. And I think this is uh, very detrimental because it hampers our, also our spiritual evolution. Mm. Okay. Okay. Free so, progress, you, you called it? Uh, free, 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 mm, oh, okay. free progress education. Sorry, progress. I don't know. Free progress education. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, um, I think we were going to take a break next week on the schedule. So uh, yeah. we'd be starting part two in two weeks. And um, uh, please, if you can make it, come, uh, come back. I'd love to see you. Uh, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Lauren, out there. Haven't heard from bye you. Bye-bye. Good, good yeah. to see, kind of see right. you there. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Stop here.